You're listening to Girls with Grafts, a burn community podcast created by Phoenix Society for Burn Survivors, a leading nonprofit dedicated to supporting the burn community. In this podcast, we'll talk with burn survivors, share resources to help with supporting and improving burn recovery, and discuss how to prevent burn injuries. Here are your hosts, burn survivors and Phoenix Society's marketing team, Amber Wilcox and Rachel Kudlak. Hello, and welcome back to Girls with Graphs. I am Rachel Kudlak, and I am joining you today with my lovely co-host, Amber Wilcox. Hey there. How's everyone doing today? It's just so nice to have another episode up and running, and this season has been so exciting so far, and I'm really, really excited to have our guest today. So without further ado, Rachel, I'm going to let you introduce him. (laughs) Yes, yes. I'm so excited for today's guest. So today we have Hadi on the podcast. He is a child burn survivor from Iran, but a London, Ontario, Canada resident. He recently graduated with a PhD in astrophysics. And don't worry, we're going to learn more about that. Um, And he is, is a passionate teacher and science communicator. He was burned in a kitchen accident with hot oil at the age of three on his face and shoulders and joined the burn survivor community only at the age of 29. Connecting with other burn survivors was a life changing moment for Hadi and it helped him to accept his scars for the first time. This experience made him speak publicly to raise awareness about the burn survivor experience and more specifically, the mental aspects of living with scars. So thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome. Thanks for having me. And it's nice to see you both, Rachel and Amber, after a long yes. time. Hadi, I was there um, kind of right in the beginning, I think, when you first were introduced to Phoenix Society, because we both came into Phoenix Society about the same time. Yes. Um, and I know a little bit about your journey, but our listeners or those watching this today um, don't know really about your journey as a survivor. Um, I know Rachel gave you a brief intro, but if you don't mind, would you share with us a little bit about your story and growing up as a child burn survivor? Absolutely. So I was burned when I was at age three in a kitchen accident. There was a hot oil and I was where I shouldn't be, like beneath the hot oil, <laughs> you know. So, well, yeah, so accident happened. And then after that, I had a few surgeries for the next few years. Uh, but after like when I was at age around six, seven, they stopped the surgeries because they said that, you know, you should grow up completely and then you're going to go back to your surgeries. And guess what? I never stopped my surgeries again because I got so busy with life. But, you know, after when I, after coming out of the hospital and just starting my normal life, uh, so the, what happened was that, you know, my lovely family, uh, we our approach to dealing with this problem was to ignore it. And my family really didn't have any support. Well, the situation in in Iran is very different and you're also talking about 30 years ago. So there wasn't any mental support. There was no no help for my family to understand how they should deal with a child bearing survivor, right? So I went home and you know, my parents were like, we are, you are like a normal kid and we are going to grow you up, help you grow up as a normal kid. So how about not, not talking about it? So that was the approach. And well, we did that. And, you know, and as I grew up, we never really talked about it. I never talked about my, to my parents and my sibling about, you know, how I'm, what I'm experiencing and how I'm feeling about you know, being different at the school, on the street, you know, if people stare at me or people would make comments. So it was something that I would, I would every day experience it, but just, I wouldn't even bring it up. And I would Mm -hmm. try to not even think about it if I could. So that was the strategy there, right? And, you know, I grew up, I know I went to high school, I went to college and, I did my undergrad in physics and then I went to US to do to do my master's degrees and here I am in Canada. And in all these years, again, I never talked to 
anyone, even with my closest friend and my family. And suddenly, by chance, I saw a picture of a bear survivor on a Facebook page. And that was uh, Toria Pitt, which is a very famous bear survivor mm -hmm. in Australia. And I was like, oh, wow, there's another bear survivor out there. And, you know, I was like, who is this lady? So I remember I went over more than 200 comments in Facebook. Maybe someone would say his, her name so I could like do more research. And someone said her name, like Toria Pitt. Okay, so I Googled it. I was like, oh, wow. You know, she has been, you know, I, I learned about her accident and her journey. And I was like, I was mind blown. So I started to search more. And for five straight days, that's all I did. Basically, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do my job. I stayed home. And for five days, I was just trying to dig more and, and just see more people who have the same experience as I did. And it was crazy. It was like the most intense emotional experience in my life. I would definitely mm -hmm. say that. Uh, so it was mind blowing, you know, all the experience, all the feeling, everything that I had about my bear and about being different. And I saw like hundreds of people out there who had exactly the same feeling. And that was a turning moment for me. It's like, mm -hmm. it totally changed the way that I see myself. And because, well, I realized that I'm not alone and that was the biggest thing. And not just that, I saw bear survivors that who are very open about their experience. And I was like, mind blown because for me it was something that i should have hide i should never bring it up i, I just i just don't want people to see that aspect of me right mm -hmm. that that's how that was my approach to being a bear survivor and then i see these fellow bear survivors they talk about they are so open about it they are proud of it they love their I'm like how how mm -hmm. they get there right so but that was the beginning of my journey. And then, you know, I just started to dig more and find communities. And fortunately, I found the Benz, uh, Phoenix Ben Survivor Society. And, you know, I also found some other societies in Canada. Uh, so I just entered the community. And it was one of the most important experiences in my life, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at some point, I joined the phoenix world congress and that was an amazing experience but you know in the past like three four years that i have i started this journey i have been learning like every single day it wasn't like a single moment that i started to accept myself it was a hard journey mm. you know you know at some point i was like okay mm. every, every, everyone else is saying that you should love your scar i'm like yeah i love my scar i love my scar but just saying it and say that i should love my scar was very different than getting to a point to say that look i i just i'm okay with who i look how i look mm. and i love it and it's just it, it was a journey to get there for me mm. i'm really glad that i'm there so <laughs> Yeah. And so I wanted to ask, so when you growing up before, you know, obviously your injury happened when you were three and you just really recently found our community. Did you know any other survivors? Did you have any interaction or you, you, you only knew your own injury? Yeah. Well, yes, I know. Well, yes, because when I was in middle school, actually there was another boy at my age, who had exactly the same bear injury as I had in my school. And it's crazy to think about it, but we didn't even talk to each other. We would see each other. Hmm. Because for me, as I said, being a bear survivor and having this facial difference was something that I was escaping, right? I was like, no, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. And then I had this boy in my school which was exactly in my situation and we didn't even get close to each other I, i'm sure he had the same feeling right and now after starting this journey i'm like oh man 
if we had started talking to each other at that age, we would have go through a totally different experience mm. because, you know, we would just share about it. Who knows how, how, we would, how that would change our life, right? Yeah. But yeah, so that was the only bear survivor that I knew, which we never talked to each other, <laughs> which is a little bit sad. Uh, but yeah, never, I never saw any other bear survivor. And then till I came to US and then Canada, and then I was exposed to the bear survivor community. So how do you, <clears throat> you talked about how, you know, you found Terria Pitt's post yep. what, in 2019. Um, and you know, you got a chance to kind of really dive into the community. Um, wondering if you've had a chance to maybe reconnect with your family on how um, it is to be a burn survivor after all of those years of maybe like not talking about it. Have you reconnected and talked about it with them? Oh, now? yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, that was a very emotional experience, you know, because I brought this up with my family and they were mind blown, you know, because... I never brought up these emotions and these feelings, and they, it's just, it was very hard for them to write because they realized that, oh, I, I needed some support, but they couldn't give me. But the problem was that they didn't know, they didn't know anything better, right? They felt that that approach to just let it go, don't bring it up, that's the best approach. And they did the best that they could. Right. But it was a very also emotional experience for them. And, you know, we started to talk about it more and more. I, and actually, my family started to tell me their perspective about, you know, mm -hmm. how they felt, how, what they went through. And I was mind blown because I realized that actually, you know, I had the experience, you know, and it's I can't talk about it. But my family, my parents, and my siblings, they also had to deal with this issue, right? Mm -hmm. For example, I had a twin, I have a twin sister, right? And now you can imagine that you're a three-year-old and then your twin brother, you know, had this has this accident. And like most of the focus of the family should go toward your brother. So how would you feel as a three-year-old mm -hmm. child, right? So that's also very that's also a very important aspect of, I, I would say, a bear survivor journey for their families because I realized that my family also needed a ton of mental support, which they didn't receive. And they had to mm -hmm. deal with them by themselves, right? And so it, it was a crazy experience to, you know, to start opening up about all these issues so many and years after yeah absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely and it, it 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 is i can just say it was crazy but i just i'm just so happy to have such a lovely family you know they did the best that they could mm -hmm. and even when i brought this up i would say i'm lucky enough that they are so understanding that they easily accepted what i said and I accepted my feeling, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I knew, I know that that's not the experience of all the brain survivors, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes their feelings would be neglected or would be pushed around. And so I'm lucky, I'm lucky in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just, that experience just told, showed me that how important it is to really take care of the caregivers of the brain survivors. Yeah. Because they also need that support. So, Definitely. yeah, I mean, for your parents, they were doing what they thought was best given yep. the journey. And I mean, clearly, you know, until you find her community, a very isolating injury, regardless of where you are in the world, you know, we always say you don't tend to know other survivors until you become a survivor and you're in our community. And then um, you realize truly how many of us are that there are are there out there right we, it's something like that um yeah. but so it's so during that time you know when you didn't have our community how did you embrace your scars or did you ignore them or what what was that like it was weird because every day i i knew that i don't like myself 
I knew that I I knew that I missed something. That's how I would see it. That oh, mm -hmm. I I miss the physical attraction, for example. And and I think that feeling was even worse than the actual the physical consequence of being a burn survivor for me. Because what happened was that I had this feeling that, okay, I'm not attractive enough. I'm not beautiful. I'm not good enough. And in my coping mechanism was to try to please others. Mm -hmm. So basically, as I was growing up, I became a people pleaser. I would do everything so people can love me because I was like, okay, if I'm not that nice person, if I'm not the best friend, I'm not the guy who you can count on him every time, every single day, maybe uh, I would lose all my social circle, right? Because I don't have anything else to offer because I'm not attractive. So, and so there was no, output support to tell me no that's not the case you don't have to go through that road but you know as a child i built this coping mechanism right mm. and that really changed that really shaped my personality and honestly that was a bigger effect for me than my appearance i would say because you know uh when I started to realize that, that, okay, that's actually how I have been living my life because of, I lack self-love and mm. I'm turning to this person, then breaking out of that, that was a, that was a tough journey also. It's, 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 it's a hard process, uh, but I had to go through it. And I'm, I'm just happy that I realized that and I was able to try to manage. Well, I would not call myself 100% recovered, but I think I'm in the right path, you know? And I think that 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 was the biggest challenge for me. I would say be, be, being a bear survivor, I'd say that mental aspect of it was the biggest challenge for me to mm -hmm. say, look, Heidi, you're good enough, mm -hmm. even though you have scars, it doesn't mean that you have to sacrifice other things to prove yourself. You don't need to do that. And that was a turning point, right? Um, so, yeah. Hadi, you and I were on a training together <clears throat> way back in the day. And I remember we talked about kind of how we would handle stares and questions from strangers, right? In those. Um, and I think probably how you handle it now with the tools that you've gained is a lot different than, than how you handled it then. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you used to, like if somebody would stare or ask you what had happened, um, what that response was versus maybe what your response might be today? Yeah, sure. Uh, I remember I, in the past, well, I, I would get off on that, but because I wanted to be nice, you know, I would just pretend that I'm okay with it. Mm -hmm. And then I had a small pitch, like a couple of questions. Oh yeah, I was born in this and that, that. And then people would make different comments and then I would just try to move on. I was just trying to just delete that from my memory. Mm. So it's like, it was like a closed door, right? Uh, but all those comments were always there, right? Mm. But now I'm like, actually, I would love to talk about my experience. So if someone bring it up, you know, they may have different tone, say mm -hmm. differently, but actually I don't mind it. I'm like, that's a opportunity to just tell someone really what it means to be a burn survivor and be careful to not be burned, you know? And right. because, because in the past, if someone would ask me, that was just another confirmation that, oh, look, you're different mm -hmm. and people are noticing. And you know, so it's just that vicious circle, right? Mm -hmm. But now I'm like, I'm, I'm okay with who I am now and I don't mind talking about it. I'm, and I'm kind of proud of it because look what I have been gone through, mm -hmm. right? And look where I am. I'm like, mm -hmm. I call myself a survivor. So I, I, I would brag about it. So why not? 
Right. So I know we talked about this before the stream, but you have a beard now, which you didn't yes. have at the time that you and I talked. Yep. And I know we get questions um, of that a lot of, you know, growing out your beard yep. on one side. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about that, right? Of like growing out a beard, what that's been like to have, because you do have visibly, you know, a beard on one side. Yep. Um, do you get questions about that, you know, about why you have it and what do you say or how do you, you know, manage it? Oh, yes. I just like how people look confused when they look at me. <laughs> they're, they're like, what, what, what's going on here? But <laughs> I enjoy it. Uh, so what happened was that till three years ago, so mm -hmm. actually more than a year through my journey, I never ever grew my facial hair because look, it's just another sign, another like, I'm just make it more noticeable that look mm -hmm. there's something different right so i never even i never even thought about it like no that, that was a big no right but a very important part of my journey was to grow up facial hair to share to show that look i'm different and i'm okay with it mm -hmm. and it was a crazy experience. The first time that they were growing, like I was taking picture every day. Oh my God, oh my God, it's growing, <laughs> you know? And then after like a month, I'm like, damn, this looks good. And you know, yeah. it's unique and I loved it. And I never shaved it again, actually. Oh, I shaved it once, I guess. Nice. I had made a mistake and I had to shave it, but you know, it grew back and actually I really loved it. And it's a kind of signature for me. And you know, uh, I like how it looks different on different sides it looks great yes but the next step was for my hair because if you remember in the past you know i i had always uh, long hair mm -hmm. i do remember and yeah i would always use my hair to cover my mm -hmm. like, this side <laughs> my yeah. to cover this bear on this side mm -hmm. and it was last year that that was the next step for me sunday mm -hmm. morning I was like, it's, it's, uh, it's enough. And I just put it in a ponytail, very high, uh -huh. so you can see the burn. And I wanted to show it off. And I wanted to say, look, yes, it looks different and I'm okay with it. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy. The moment that I walked out of my apartment that day, the level of confidence that I felt was like nothing that I experienced before. Mm -hmm. Because for the first time, I'm like, look, this is me. I, mm -hmm. I'm not covering anything. That's me. If you don't like it, good. You don't like it, good. Doesn't matter because that's me. And I'm enjoying it, right? Mm -hmm. So it looks good on you. <laughs> yeah, Confidence you. looks good on thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And it's funny when you're talking about that, I can relate to that because I part my hair this way because I have my, wait, yeah, over here, my facial burn and my eyebrow is partially burned off. So I always grew up parting my hair this way to cover my missing eyebrow, but I just like how it looks now, but I don't mind the missing eyebrow part. <laughs> yeah. 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 Actually, my eyebrow is also <laughs> part of it is gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and so you you have this beautiful story of learning to you know embrace and now you're showing off your scars which is absolutely amazing but we all know that's not the easiest thing for survivors to do so what advice or what tips or what kind of helped you get here and what would you want other survivors to know okay well that's where i am now you, if mm -hmm. you ask me this question, maybe two years ago, my, I may have a different answer. If you ask me in two years, I may have a different answer. Mm -hmm. But that's where I am now. I'm not saying that this would work for everyone and that's the best thing to wait. The best way to deal with it. Right now, I think that one thing that helps me to really uh, be in the right path to progress in this journey is that to come to understanding that I can't change anything around me. Mm. So look, you know, I can't be worried about what people would think about me. I can wor be worried about 
you know, if I'm covering my scar or not and how people would see it. But at the end of the day, let's say even if like all the people in my town would accept me and they know me and they're okay with being a burn survivor, like I may go to another city and then th those people may not have seen a burn survivor. So I would always get those stares. I would always get questions. I would always get those look. And for a while, I was trying really hard to like educate the society to say, look, like don't stare at bear survivors. And uh, well, I wish that we don't have that problem, but basically my focus was to teach the society that to how to deal with someone with facial difference, right? Mm -hmm. But now where I am is like, man, you can't change the whole world, right? But I can only change one thing, how I'm gonna interpret my world around me. And that has given me such a beautiful peace because I'm like, tomorrow morning, someone may give me a nasty comment. I don't care because, you know, people are out there who would give people nasty comments. It's like, I can change that. Mm -hmm. But I can just hear it and say, it's sad that that person, mm -hmm. you know, maybe is not exposed to this issue. What can I do about it? I can just move on and just enjoy my life. Right. So... For Ben Survival, I know how I, I, because if you would tell me this, what I'm saying now, two years ago, two years ago, I would not accept it. And I, that's very understandable because what I realized is that being a bear survivor and recovering from it is really a long journey. And we are at every, every one of us, we are at different points of our journey and we just need our own solution for where we are, you know? So there's not a single best answer to that question to, okay, how to deal with things. Uh, mm -hmm. But I would say, just give it time. You're not, you're not going to go outside tomorrow and not be offended by anyone's comment. It not, may not happen in a week, it may not happen in two weeks, but it's okay where you are and how you feel. It's, mm -hmm. you have, it's okay, your feelings are okay, but I think things would get better. And it's just a journey. And I think eventually, I hope that we all get to that point that we just accept who we are. And I can tell about my experience is that getting there, which I'm not 100% there yet, but getting close to that place it just has solved many issues for me. Mm. And so, yeah, just focusing on myself and how I would see, which is like the hardest thing in the world. So what I'm saying is. is like the hardest <laughs> thing in the world, right? Well, and to ignore, right, all of the things around us sometimes is even harder because I know like to, you know, whether it, it's about my burn or someone says something to you that really just gets to your gut. It's really hard to ignore it. Um, but <laughs> that is a learned skill, right? Of like, um, moving on from it, I find myself having to do that as well, right? Of like that person has their own things that they're dealing with, um, where they felt the need to do that, but it, it's not something that can happen easily. And I, you know, especially I think with my burn injury, I had to learn that more of, right? Like what happens, um, some circumstances are beyond my control and I have to kind of just sit with that and, I think yoga helps me with that because it help teaches you to sit with that uncomfortable feeling sometimes, yeah. which sitting with uncomfortable feelings um, is uncomfortable, <laughs> but yeah. they're meant to. So I, I love that you said that because I think that's really important for survivors to know of like, yeah, it's going to be uncomfortable, but yeah. um, it's okay to just sit with the uncomfortable sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. And I think you brought up a good point too of, you know, you talked about growing out your beard and then you eventually went to show off and pull your hair back. So it's also about baby steps. It doesn't have to be. Exactly. It's not an overnight thing. And, exactly. you know, I'm almost 25 years out from my injury and I'm still on this journey learning and yeah. getting better each day. So it's, it's not something I wish, I wish we could have an overnight magic trick yeah. that just made everything better, but Unfortunately, that's just not how it is. And yeah. you both taught me something today because I don't have facials, you know, 
burn scars, but um, hearing you both talk about how you use your hair to cover your face, um, I was fascinated to learn just even about both of you. So um, I think that's interesting of like as facial burn survivors, you know, I can cover my um, burns with my pants, but um, it's a lot, lot more difficult. So overcoming that, um, that's huge, Hadi. So um, Okay. So I want to switch gears a little bit because, um, and before I ask you some in-depth questions, I really want to know about this PhD in astrophysics. Um, the only thing I know about like space is what I've learned from the big bang theory. So, um, I really would love to know a little bit about, um, what it means to have your PhD in astrophysics and, um, you defended your PhD. So, um, do you want to tell us in, terms that we can understand, hopefully, <laughs> what it is that you did with your PhD. Sure. Well, you better not get me started talking about the space, <laughs> but here we are. Okay. I love talking about space, so it's good. You're good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I always loved the space and astronomy and stars. So I basically doing this PhD was like my childhood dream to become an astronomer. And, you know, uh, in my PhD, so what I did was basically, so let me give you a background. You know, in the universe, when you think about the universe, it's you have this vast space, mm -hmm. like the whole universe, which is mostly empty, right? And then we have these little islands of little small universes, which are, we call them galaxies, which are floating around in the universe. And these each galaxy has like, hundreds of me billions of stars and we have something like 100 billion galaxies in the universe and each galaxy has like 100 billion stars in it and we on earth we are going around the sun and we are in one of those galaxies and so here we are sitting on earth on earth and we are just trying to understand like the whole picture you mm -hmm. know how how this happened how like this universe came to be you know where did all these things came from and so for my phd what i did basically i tried to understand how old are these galaxies so we have all these galaxies in the universe and we are in one of them hmm. so basically you can ask this question how long these galaxies have been around is it like for example earth is five billion years Old. Mm -hmm. that's our best estimation you know so you can say oh yeah maybe our galaxy is like at least five billion years around right how about other galaxies well or is our galaxy five billion years old or maybe f older so that's basically what i did for my phd so i had to uh, write a computer program which if you take a picture of a galaxy and you give it to my program my program can tell you how old it is wow and and that's a very important part of a bigger picture, because as I said, you know, we look at the universe, we wonder how the hell this thing happened, right? Mm -hmm. All these galaxies, all these stars, all these planets, you know, how they came to be. And then life on top of that, like all these complexities. So this is like the biggest question that we as astronomers and physicists and scientists, we are trying to answer. And for me, what I did my PhD was a small piece of puzzle in that question. So we know how old our galaxies, when they formed, when they formed their stars. And hopefully that piece of puzzle would help the rest of it to give us a better picture, like, you know, how this universe works. So that was basically what I did for my PhD. That's fascinating. And you explained it in such great terms because I really wouldn't have thought that I would have been able to understand it. So this is fantastic. But um, did you come to the conclusion of how old other galaxies are? I know you're you're looking at that. Do you have any answers for us on galaxy age? Yeah. Well, you know, most of the galaxies started to form right after the Big Bang, so which we think is the beginning of the universe, which has happened around 14 billion years ago. So Earth was... 5 billion years old, Big Bang happened 14 billion years ago. And you know, some galaxies started to form during that time. And it's actually really hard to say how old are galaxies because you know, galaxies, sometimes they form continuously through the time. It's not like they form like that in a moment and then they always there. No. So 
it's, it's a tricky question. So when we say how old are galaxies, we can, the way that I answer it using my research is that, you know, this galaxy formed most of the stars in, in that galaxy, in itself, uh, in that galaxy, maybe around 10 billion years ago, maybe around mm -hmm. 5 billion years ago. So it's like it's a range of age that you would assign to these galaxies. And most of the galaxies are very old, around more than 10 billion years old. Oh, wow. So you have your PhD in astrophysics. To get that, you had to, to get up, I think, and stand up in front of your colleagues and defend it. Yes. Um, if it weren't for, um, and I saw some pictures online, um, but if it weren't for um, your kind of connection to the community, um, how do you think that's changed your ability to kind of get up there and speak um, in front of others? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the most important thing that I got out of my journey of in recovering from being a brain survivor was my confidence, right? You know, just the idea of that, that you're starting to accept yourself and you always are not in this defense position to, oh, I have to do things right. So make sure that people understand me and accept me. So that will help me to boost my confidence. And, you know, during my talk, it was the best talk that I had, I think I have gave in my life. I absolutely enjoyed it and I was very confident and that for sure is, it would not be like that even if if I wasn't start, if I didn't start this journey as mm -hmm. to recover from bear survivor, probably I would be still that very anxious with low self-confidence person, which is just trying its best to just fit. But now, I'm like, no, I'm not that. So, so you're not that, right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, I know you're active on some of the F Facebook survivor groups. And what do you hope to accomplish by sharing your story? Because I also saw those photos and you look like you did a great job um, defending it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, for me, for sharing is that. I, I just look at the experience that I had, right? I just saw a single picture of Toria Pete that changed my life, literally, mm -hmm. right? So, and I'm like, okay, I have gone through this experience. And if I just put my story out there, if it can reach to a single person, I don't know, maybe in 10 years, and that can help them a little bit, I think that's enough. That's a good enough reason to do it. Mm -hmm. And the community that we have is just so amazing. Every time that I go to our forums that we have and I listen to, you know, the stories or in the World Burn Congress that we have, it's just unbelievable. It's just mm -hmm. the stories that you see and you hear. It's, it's mind-blowing. And it's just there's a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. And I'm just... I, I, I hope that I can be a part of that social support, which mm -hmm. if unfortunately someone new comes to this, to this society, they can see, okay, no, actually there, there are ways out there, there, to, to get out of this. There are, mm -hmm. you know, there is a way to still enjoy your life, enjoy yourself, enjoy who you are. doesn't matter, you know, what happened. So I just hope that I can be part of a small part of that whole system of support mm -hmm. because you I definitely are <laughs> you definitely are a part of our community um Hadi so tell us what's next right for you so you defended your PhD um what are you hoping to do next um both you know professionally but also yeah. um within the community yes sure uh so right now I guess I'm at the moment that I am changing my career. Uh, so because, you know, I always wanted to become a researcher, become an astrophysicist, do research, in, become a faculty member in a university. But at the moment, uh, I'm looking for position outside of the university, outside of academia. Uh, I'm looking for positions in data science, in finance, and in other uh, areas areas yeah. uh 
And, you know, so I, I did actually job searching moment. I have actually a few interviews coming up. So it's pretty exciting and also stressful. And yeah, yeah we'll but cross it's our going well. For, you for sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's going well. And at the same time, I'm just trying to wrap up a, a little bit of research that is left, which before officially finishing the PhD. And so that would be my career plan for the future. Ho hopefully it goes according to the plan. You know, <laughs> because I need a job, I should pay my bills. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you get to do what you're passionate about, right? Is discover the the you know the stars and galaxies, and that's amazing. But yes, yeah. I'm sure. Um, I'm sure. Like diving into job interviews can also be. Um, you know, uncomfortable at times because you, yeah. you know, you're worried about how that those interactions will go. And, and so I'm sure that's just another hurdle for you to, yeah. to go but through. It's actually fun. It's like, it's a new experience. And I'm like, oh yeah, this is actually, mm -hmm. you know, I'm learning a lot and it's fun. It's fun. And those it's... are the tools that you brought with you as a survivor, yeah. which is amazing. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah. So, and for the community, well, I, I'm hoping that I can join my first burn World Congress in person because uh, I have only attended virtually mm -hmm. and I, you know, whenever I talk to other fellow bear survivors, when they talk about being there in person and they talk about mm -hmm. their experiences, I'm like, oh God, I want to be there in person. So mm -hmm. hopefully I can be there in person sometime. Uh, and yeah, that would be great. So because I really want to meet more bear survivors in, mm -hmm. know, in person. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Rachel. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, I can second that statement of once you're in World Burn Congress in person and you see a huge crowd of survivors, and you're like, hey, those are my people. I'm with them. And it's just fun to take over, you know, the hotel with our community. Yeah. <laughs> I and you talk wait. about being connected in Canada as well. So do you have groups in Canada that you're a part of? Oh, yes. Actually, we have a wonderful group in Canada. Uh, and yeah, so they usually meet like every year or every other year as well. Uh, but, you know, pandemic like destroyed mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's funny because at the same time, it was great for me because that was like the beginning of my journey. So everything went online. So actually I had access to even remote resources and, you know, meetings. So it actually was kind of helpful for me, but yeah, we have a good community in Canada and they have a kind of weekly uh, support group, which I used to attend, but uh, as Amber knows, in the past few months, I have been skipping all the support group because I was busy defending <laughs> my PhD. And my plan is to reconnect again with both Phoenix uh, support yeah. groups and also what the support group that we have in Canada because well, we, it's just I can't amazing. Wait to see you. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, um, I know we're coming up on time here, but before we ask you our final questions, do you have anything else that you want to share with the community that we may not have touched on today? Anything physical challenges that you may have struggled with that you want to talk to us about or anything else that, um, you know, you, this is your time, Hadi. So what do you want to share with the community today? Uh, yeah, one thing that I want to say is to, if you are scared of something, just expose yourself to it slowly. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm a science communicator as well. I have done, in, during my PhD, I have done a lot of public events for astronomy in our observatory. You know, I had a lot of events for kids. And that was my biggest fear, actually. You know, I have been teaching for a long time. And, you know, I built my confidence to really go in a classroom and be at the center of attention, right? Uh, but my biggest worry was, for example, was working with kids because, mm. you know, I'm, I'm going there, I'm giving an astronomy talk to a group of, you know, five to 10 years old. And my biggest fear was that what if some, some little kid, you know, get scared mm -hmm. while looking at me because it has happened to me before, you know, I, you know, I, I have, you know, it has happened to me that, you know, in the street, you know, a little kid would see me and they would get a little bit scared and they would go to their mom. And so I'm like, what's going to happen if that happened in my lecture? 
right? right. Uh, but what's the solution for it? Just go and do it and see if it happens or not and try mm -hmm. to deal with it. And surprise, it never happened. You know, I had tons of events. And mm -hmm. it's funny because I was so worried about, you know, being in that those events with small kids. And I think their reaction was even much, even way better than when I had events for uh, with adults because they just don't care. <laughs> Most mm -hmm. like, just mm -hmm. don't care. And they just, yeah. So that was one example for me to just expose yourself. If, if you're worried that, you know, you may not be able to do this because of your facial defense or you're, you would, it would be uncomfortable. If you can expose yourself slowly, that's mm -hmm. for me in my personal experience, that was the way to really mm. progress slowly, slowly. So, mm -hmm. and you can think about this in other scenarios, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I think with, children specifically, they just kind of speak their mind, right? So yeah. I remember um, early on in my journey, uh, my husband and I were going to visit our cousins and, um, you know, wa wondering or worrying what they're going to say or how you're going to react and, and um, kind of just being open to that moment and knowing like mm -hmm. what you need to say. Because I know for me, um, you know, she asked like, what's, you know, what's on your leg? Because it does look different. And so uh, just had, you know, giving that child level of understanding of like, oh, there's a boo-boo there. I'm okay. Um, and even saying like, oh, don't they look like mermaid scales, right? Or something mm -hmm. funny to kind of, and she kind of just like looked at it. It was 30 seconds of her life. And then she turned around and walked away. And so she, yeah. it was like just curiosity. <laughs> um, but sometimes they're more open to say something, I think, than even adults is. So that like gut of like, well, how am I going to react to that moment can be really scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah kids kids love to blurt out their questions and comments and then but they get over it in a few seconds yep. meanwhile adults just stare from afar <laughs> and don't yeah i feel like yep. i could deal with a child looking at them yeah. all day but kids sometimes i'm like okay or adults i'm like mm, i don't know yeah. how to react to this so <laughs> yeah well, Hadi, we are wrapping up on time here, but we always ask our guests two final questions. So um, the first question I have for you is self-care. So I know you talked a lot about mental health, right? And recognizing um, how important that is, especially since you've kind of overcome or not even overcome, but really like, you know, recognize your scars. So how do you practice self-care um, today? Uh, well, for me, the most useful tool is workout. Uh, it's really, honestly, I would say mm -hmm. workout, do, starting doing work, like mm -hmm. physical activities really saved me uh, because uh, it's funny because when I started my burn survivor journey, mm -hmm. it really helped me to deal with a lot of basic issues that I had, right? But I still wasn't at that level of self-acceptance. And actually I was dealing with a, some sort of depression as well. So it, it was a hard time at the middle of the pandemic. And then one thing that's really saved me was to, for the first time in my life actually, to really do physical activity regularly every week and really push it. And mm -hmm. it changed everything. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's, it's like magic. It's unbelievable. Especially mm -hmm. for me who never was active in my life, starting doing that, it really ch changed me physically and mentally. And I just can't emphasize it enough mm -hmm. that it doesn't matter how hard it is. If you do it, it's, it, it gonna, you, you're going to see the effect. So mm -hmm. just do it. <laughs> you're going to see the effect. Mm -hmm. My husband my husband is, was my primary caregiver, as you know, and, and, yeah. um, even to this day, right. If I'm having a bad day, it doesn't have to relate anything to my burn injury, but he's like, let's go. We're going to go for a walk. Cause he knows mm -hmm. that like activity of mm -hmm. walking and being able to talk it out or going yeah. to a yoga class or something is what I physically need. Um, and I found that so, so helpful during my journey as well as it didn't matter if it was a, you know, a, a short walk or, you know, yeah. a rigorous hot yoga class as, as long as I kind of mm -hmm. got out 
and got moving and got out of my head, um, that really helped me as well. Mm-hmm. And I know That's Rachel, right. you're a, you're a big fitness person as well, correct? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I always feel better if I start my day, even if it's 15 minutes, but I get a good sweat in. I just yeah. automatically feel better. And yeah. I, it's it's just I have to do it. Or even if it's a quick walk outside, but just a little move morning movement is what I like to say every day. <laughs> well, and so our last question for you today is. Do you do anything special to celebrate your burn anniversary? And I was actually curious when I was thinking about asking you this. Do you know exactly when your burn anniversary was? Since I know you didn't talk a lot about it growing up. Uh, yes. Uh, so <laughs> actually, it's uh, I know the day. It's a very specific day in Persian calendar for Iranian. Mm. It's actually a day that people do a lot of firework outside. So actually, we, and that oh, wow. on that day, we have a lot of burn injuries because people do mm-hmm. a lot of fireworks. But for, for me, it was a kitchen accident. Exactly. So yes, it's that day. But no, I don't, I don't celebrate it. Uh, I mean, I just somehow, for whatever reason, it's just, I try to, I don't correlate those two that day with my parents. Maybe because from childhood, I just tried to ignore it, ignore it. Mm-hmm. So I never really correlated that day with that accident, which I think is just how I dealt with it. Mm-hmm. Do you guys yeah. do something especially special for it? Uh, yes and no. I always like to, I mean, I just like eating nice food in general. So (laughs) I always try to either go out to dinner or make something special at home. Um, Just another day to talk about me, basically. (laughs) If I have a chance to have a second birthday, Hadi, I'm going to. Um, (laughs) But but, um, I think for, for me, like the first year we made this whole you know, we did a big thing with it. We went to the fire station um, and, and celebrated oh, nice. the folks that helped me after I was burned. Um, I was able to connect with the EMT who performed the special procedure in the ambulance to um, keep my body temperature, like what it needed to be and all of that. Um, and so it was fun to kind of connect back with him and really talk about that day because he did remember me um, because he didn't have to do that particular, whatever it is he did, some formula um with like how hydrated i had to be um he remembered and so i was known as that girl um and then the firefighters that were there at the time so i was able to connect with them bring them like pizza and my husband and i just sat and talked to them for a while so it was a surreal experience um but then after that we kind of you know the next year my husband and i went for a walk that day um and so it's kind of changed and this year it's coming up um, and I don't know what we'll do um, this year, but I think, um, you know, as the years go on, I think like the first year is just a big, you know, celebration. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I'm with Rachel, if I can have an excuse to celebrate me another day, why wouldn't I, right? <laughs> so um, maybe yeah, we'll yeah. just make my husband take me to a, good, a nice dinner or something mm-hmm. this year. <laughs> good idea. Well, honey. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. Um, two birthdays, like you know, I already love my birthday enough as it is. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so how do you? I think, do you... I think I should do the same thing. I, I should just find <laughs> another birthday. Like it's a second. Yeah. It's a rebirth day. A lot of uh, folks yeah. on the podcast have told us that, right? Of mm-hmm. um, it's their like rebirth day, so they se- celebrate it as like a second birthday. So I give see. yourself a gift that day. Go go celebrate with something you like to do. Um, I sometimes try to go get like a massage around that time too. Oh yeah. I'm like down for that. Self-care. <laughs> so there you go. You, you have, <laughs> you have some things to start doing on that day, honey, and we'll have yeah. to hear about it when it happens. But yes, um, we want to thank you so much for being on this episode. Um, before we close out today, do you have any final thoughts to share with girls with graphs in our community? Well, no, first of all, just thanks for having me. It was very nice to actually see you guys after a long time and just talk. And yeah, so thanks for that. And for the Bern community, all I can say is that I love you all. You are all amazing. You are warriors. You are, you, like, you are going through a tough experience and you're coming strong. And every single of us should be proud of it. Mm-hmm. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, be proud of us. I know it's hard, but we should be proud of what we are going through 
because we are warriors. So, mm -hmm. well, congratulations on your PhD. Thank and you. And hopefully, we'll see you at the next World Burn Congress. Yes, yes. hopefully. Yes, thank <laughs> you. Good yep, thank Bye. you. Have a good night. Bye. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Girls with Crafts. If you are enjoying this content, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps others find the show, and we greatly appreciate it. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.